Thank you, Xavier, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is uh, Emily Lee Proust, and uh, I'll talk to you today about uh, what we can do with synthetic DNA. So I'll give a quick introduction about TWIST, and then what uh, I'll tell you what our customers do with DNA. So we have funded three years and a half ago. Uh, we are 150 people. Most of them are in San Francisco, but we have a research center in uh, Tel Aviv. And as Xavier said, we raised $134 million. What we do is we make DNA from scratch. And the chemistry to make DNA is actually well known. Uh, it works, but it's very slow and it's very expensive. And that is because everybody uses the 96 well plate. That's the piece of plastic on the left. And with that piece of plastic, which is the size of two iPhones, uh, you can make one gene. And what we've done is we've miniaturized everything, and we have a piece of silicon on the right where we have 10,000 of those in the same space. So we can make 10,000 genes um, and uh, at 10,000 times lower cost and, and uh, much faster. So we're really providing a game-changing um, opportunity to customers to have more genes uh, faster and cheaper. What our customers do with the genes is uh, well understood. It's the engineering principle of design, build, test. So they design a bunch of DNA mutations they want to try. We build it, we ship it to them, and then they test and to find which one of those mutations works the way they want. And then they go back to that cycle uh, five, ten times in order to get their, their answer. And right now the building is the bottleneck, and that's what we solve with our silicon uh, technologies. The market is, is big. It's a billion dollar market uh, for synthetic DNA. And uh, we are at the beginning of our commercialization. This is the second quarter that we, uh, we ship genes. Um, but we are already uh, the number one provider by volume of, of genes, the number of genes we ship every month. And uh, our intent is to take the entire market. So next, I want to talk about what can we do with DNA? How is DNA going to change the world? So twist, we make a bunch of DNA, but uh, the, the next few slides will, will be all about what our, our customers do uh, to have an impact. So we'll start with, uh, with uh, hunger. The population is growing, and the amount of land available is shrinking. So we need to make more food uh, with less land. And uh, um, if we look back, humans have done that before. Uh, on the left uh, or in the middle, you can see what wild watermelon looks like, what wild banana looks like, what wild corn looks like. Nobody can hit that. And so over the last 10,000 years, uh, the human civilization has selected for better and better crops. And you can see on the right how corn has evolved over the last 10,000 years. And now we need to do more uh, in order to get more yield, provide more food um, um, in order to feed the world. Uh, as an example of uh, the, the, the next step in food production uh, will be to remove the need for fertilizer. Fertilizer is a third of the cost of growing food, and it will be quite polluting. You need a lot of oil to make uh, fertilizer. And some of our customers are inserting in the bacteria that live in soil the um, gene cluster that uh, enable the, mi the microbe to fix nitrogen from the air and feed that nitrogen as fertilizer to the plant, so you'll be able to grow plants without fertilizer. Beyond uh, just making food and making calories, something that's important too is nutrition. Uh, there are some uh, lots of uh, kids, hundreds of thousands of kids that only have access to rice for nutrition, and so they don't get the vitamin A they need, and 670,000 kids uh, a year die because they don't have enough uh, uh, vitamin A. And so some researchers put the, the, the gene clusters of, for the production of vitamin A into rice, that's called golden rice, so as you get the calories, you also get the, the nutrients that you need uh, in order to have a, a healthy um, uh, life. Um, sorry, another example that I'll give around food is vanilla. 99% uh, of vanilla in the world is made chemically because there's not enough vanilla tree to, to feed the demand. And the vanilla is made by a chemical process where you take oil and you make benzene, and benzene will kill you, and then you make um, phenol, and phenol will kill you, and then you have three chemical steps to get vanilla flavor. 
So it, it, it's not a great process. And a company called Evolva, they've developed a, a yeast, so they've modified yeast to ferment sugar and to create uh, the vanilla flavor, such that uh, we'll have, all have access to uh, vanilla that still tastes the same, uh, but is uh, much healthier than and getting vanilla from, from oil. Moving on to disease, um, there's lots of opportunity to use DNA to, to solve uh, key disease problems. I'll take the example of artemisinin, that is a life-saving drug um, that um, uh, uh, treats malaria. And uh, if the way uh, artemisinin is, uh, is made is uh, you grow a plant and you extract it from that plant. It takes 10 months from planting the plant to get it, getting the, the drug. And uh, that uh, leads to um, uh, times where there's no drug available. And there's a company called Ameris, and they developed, a, again, a yeast process where you're fermenting sugar to make the same chemical, and that only takes three months. So uh, that enables the, um, uh, the availability of drug uh, at all time. And all, that's all thanks to, to DNA. Uh, in the other area of disease, the classic um, drug discovery now is to use antibody. And more than 50% of the, the drugs that are being developed are based on antibodies and biologics. And they, you start from DNA, and you use a lot of DNA sequences to find the one drug. The next frontier there is to use uh, um, cells that are programmed to attack specific cells in the body. So this is a movie of a, a killer cell that has been modified to recognize the cancer cell. And so in the, 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 the big uh, cell in the middle that becomes red, that's the cancer cell. And once the uh, uh, white blood cell that has been modified find that cancer cell, uh, it, uh, it uh, starts the um, killing process and the destruction of, of cancer. So in the future, uh, cancer will become a chronic disease, um, thanks to uh, uh, Oxford nanopore that we seen earlier. Uh, you'll be able to sequence the tumor, know the mutation that will kill you, and then um, modify your own immune system to recognize that cancer and and uh, and destroy it. Um, the, the next frontier after that will be CRISPR, and I won't talk about CRISPR because the next uh, speaker will, will uh, describe it, um, but that will uh, provide even more precision in being able to address um, mutations and disease in, in our own bodies. Moving on to sustainability, as a society, we have enormous needs. We, we don't realize it, but the so our society needs a lot of energy, uh, a lot of fuel, a lot of materials like plastic, as well um, uh, as a lot of fertilizer, for instance, to, to, to feed us. And creating all those chemicals um, takes uh, uh, biomass. And that biomass is coal, it's oil, it's gas, and there's this massively polluting process to create the, the, the products that we need. And so with DNA, we're able to do uh, something that's much better. And, and uh, when we do that, we'll be able to eliminate oil as the source of our life, because all of those products uh, that you see on the screen and almost everything we touch in, in life uh, comes from oil. And instead, what we'll be able to do is uh, we'll be able to modify yeast, algae, and E. coli, so modify uh, organisms, and create biofactories. And those biofactories are non-toxic, and those biofactories, they use sugar, they use CO2, they use sunlight, things that are plentiful, and we can, do the exact, we can create the exact same products. So the idea is we'll use biology to uh, enable us to get everything we need to, uh, to live our, our lives in a way that, uh, that's non-toxic. So just a few examples. Um, uh, rhino horn, uh, the, the cost of uh, rhino horn is it's per weight, it's uh, higher than, than gold. Only heroin is more expensive than, than uh, rhino horn. And uh, uh, as it, the, the, the population of, of rhinos has been decimated. And there's a company in, the, in California that uh, is using synthetic biology to create in the lab um, the protein the carotene-like protein, the same uh, protein that's uh, in the rhino horn, such that when you get it, you can't tell the difference between whether it was made in the lab or it was, made, uh, it was taken from a rhino. So the idea is to flood the market with cheap 
uh, rhino horns uh, and, and, and save uh, those uh, animals. Another example is squalene. Squalene is uh, the oil that your body naturally makes. And so it's extremely important. It's a key component of uh, uh, cosmetic products. And uh, in order to get squalene, you, have to, you can only extract it either from human skin, which is uh, not ideal, uh, or you can extract it from shark levers. And from, you need uh, 3,000 sharks to get one ton of levers. So every year there, there, was, there were uh, millions of sharks that were actually uh, uh, killed just to uh, get uh, the, the, that chemical. And again, there is a, a company in, in California that has developed a synthetic biology process to make that product. And again, it's, it's yeast, you feed sugar, you get fermentation, and you can create the exact same chemical. And uh, so now it's a, it's a stable way to create that, that chemical. Another example is a carpet. We all use carpet, and, and the nylon um, comes from oil. But uh, now there's a, a brand of carpet sold by uh, uh, DuPont. It's the Sonora brand. And the nylon in the carpet was made by fermentation of sugar. It, it came from the, uh, the, the, the leftover from corn. So you get corn, you, you take the, the, the kernel for food, and whatever is left over, that is biomass. And so you can use that cellulose um, to, um, by fermentation again, uh, create uh, and adipic acid that is then transformed into carpet. So you can buy carpet where the carbon comes from the air instead of coming from oil. So it's, it's a great uh, advance. Um, I think it's my final example of, of, uh, uh, of uh, chemicals is uh, spider silk. So it turns out that spider silk is one of the best materials for food, it, uh, for, for clothes. It's so good that you can even put it in the washing machine and it, it, it still works. The problem with spider silk is you cannot farm spider. If you, have a, a, um, if you start with a million spider, um, after a week, you have one spider because they all kill each other. Um, so it's not uh, practical to, to farm um, spiders. However, you can take the genes of, uh, of spiders that make the silk, put it in uh, E. coli or algae uh, or yeast, and you can produce the same protein uh, by fermentation. <coughs> And there's a company called Ball Thread in Emeryville, and they're uh, in the process of commercializing um, spider silk that was made uh, by fermentation. So that's an example of a new chemical where you have no chance of making it by oil, but it's a, it's a new chemical with uh, much advanced, advanced uh, properties. And uh, finally, with uh, uh, around sustainability, a uh, huge impact to the environment uh, comes from food production. Uh, I am not a vegetarian, as I eat meat, but actually meat is, is uh, one of the uh, uh, biggest polluters uh, of our planet. And uh, now you can um, create meat without animals. On the left, in the middle, you can get uh, milk without cows. On the right, you can get uh, eggs uh, without chicken. Um, egg, egg white without uh, chicken or without eggs. And that uh, um, um, it's, it's a more sustainable way to make uh, the, the, the food. And it turns out that uh, it's you, when it's well developed, you can't tell the difference because it's the exact same composition of protein in, in the food. So uh, coming uh, near you soon, a burger with uh, um, no worries of uh, greenhouse uh, emission. Um, greenhouse gas emission from, from the animals. So, and the last uh, example I'll give is around data explosion. Um, we live a digital life and there's an explosion of, of, of data. And it turns out that uh, uh, we have lots of ways of storing data. You can put your data in the cloud, you can put it on a hard drive, on, on, on a stick. The problem with all those uh, um, uh, data media is that it's, um, <coughs> it evolves very quick. And actually, if you look, just a few decades ago, um, we were using uh, floppy disks and, and, and tapes. And those, uh, if you have data on, on those media, you cannot get that data back. That data uh, is inaccessible. 
But if you look at, at nature, um, <clears throat> nature has chosen DNA to store data. Um, you can find mammoth DNA that's 20,000 years old. You can put it in a machine and you can sequence it and you'll get, you can, you can see what that sequence is. So actually, DNA is a much better uh, media for storing data for the long term. And so, how do you even store data in DNA? Actually, uh, it's, it's fairly simple uh, conceptually. Uh, a, a data file is a, is a PDF, let's say a PDF file, for instance, it has a, a zeros and ones. So it's a two base encoding uh, a file. You can convert that two base encoding into a four base encoding, uh, zero, one, two, three, and uh, that is ACGT. So you can take any file and turn it into a genome. And then you send that genome to Twist, and we'll make the DNA from scratch on our machine. And you can store that data for a long time, thousands of years. Um, and you don't, need, uh, you don't even need a freezer, just put it in a cool, dry place, and it's, it's stable. And once you need the data back, you just put it on a sequencing machine, and you can retrieve the ACGs and TN and, and decode it and get your, your file back. And it turns out that uh, it, uh, it works really well. And uh, the beauty of it is that DNA is extremely dense. Actually, it's so dense that uh, if you, you could take all the data uh, from the internet, and if you were to make that as DNA, it would fit in a shoebox. So, um, so th therefore, the two key advantages of DNA is that one, it's, it's stable for, forever, and two, it's extremely dense. And we've uh, done a, a collaboration with the University of uh, Washington and Microsoft, where Microsoft purchased uh, 100 million oligos uh, front with, so 100 million pieces of, of DNA. And uh, uh, they uh, baked it uh, to simulate um, aging. And when they sequenced the data back, everything was, was there, 100% of the bytes that they encoded and they recovered. And so uh, the future of long-term storage uh, will be in DNA. So with that, um, to summarize, uh, there's lots of things we can do with DNA, uh, from uh, uh, solving hunger, solving disease, uh, solving sustainability, even, even data. Um, uh, DNA is, uh, is, is the key. Uh, to do all of those applications. And I, I, at the end, what I always like to say is that we only have one Earth. We're all on here. We are stuck here for the, 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 the near term. Uh, Elon Musk is going to get us to Mars, but for now, we are here. And so um, <clears throat> we have to uh, do with uh, the resources that, that we have. And uh, the, I'm very uh, optimistic the future is very bright because we have, uh, there are a lot of biological researchers that are solving the key problems that we have all using DNA. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you very much for your attention.